Today I want to talk about what will your tomorrow be like. Just a very simple thing. A question for you. And I opened it up in first service. I opened it up in this service too. What will your tomorrow be like? What's it going to be like? You have a choice today of what your tomorrow is going to be. Remember, I've always told you life is choice driven. You live or die by the choices you make. And the result of where you are now is where you are now is based upon the choices that you made prior to this day. You don't have nobody to blame. You can't put it on nobody. You are the result of your choices. Every choice has consequences. They're either good or they're bad. But you have the ability to choose. That's what God gave you. That's what God gave Adam and Eve in the beginning when he said of all the trees, you can eat of all of them with the exception of one. I give you the choice. If you want to eat of that one, you can eat of it. But you must not eat of it because in the day that you eat of it, it'll be the day you're going to die. But you got a choice. The Lord has told us many different times, I set before you now life and death. Choose. So today, I'm letting you know that you will have a choice of what your tomorrow is going to be. And there are certain things I want to I wanna get across to you, so I'm going to give you a purpose of this message today. And the purpose of this message is this, to cause you to realize that there is life after death. That's the first thing I want to get you to get. There's life after death. You may think that all you see right now is all it is. No, sir. No, ma'am. It's unfortunate that many people in their ignorance think they know what the truth is. And if it's not predicated upon what the word of God is, it's not truth. The only truth is the truth that God has given us through Jesus Christ. There is no other truth other than the truth of Christ. There is no other God but the God that we serve through Christ. And the only way to that God is Christ. He is not a way. He is the only way. There is only one truth, and that's the truth of the Word of God. Doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't matter what you feel. Doesn't matter what you even believe. The only thing that matters is what does God say? And so I want you to know there is life after death. There's only one person that's been dead and come back to talk about it. And that's the proof that he is God in the flesh. But I want you to understand that there is life after death and that a failure to honor God is he says that you would honor him. A failure to honor God in this life as he says, will tragically result in a permanent and unchangeable existence in the next life he promised to come. Yeah. Let me, let me kind of reiterate this thing so you can understand. I want you to know where I'm going before I go there, and I'm going to prove everything. First of all, to cause you to realize that this is not the only life you got. So don't, don't just get so caught up in this one that you lose sight of the fact that there is life after death. And that a failure to honor God in this life. Now, to honor God, I specifically said to honor God as he says you have to honor him. A lot of people are honoring God the way they want to honor God. A lot of people are serving God the way they want to serve God. But we just sang a song, have thine own way, mold me and make me. After your way, after your work, you, Lord, are the potter. We just the clay. Yeah. But as many of us who are telling God, I'm going to shape myself this way, now bless me. Yeah. It's the same thing I did a few years ago when I told God I was never going to be no preacher. I said, you got a choice, Lord. I gave God a choice, and I told him, I'm either going to be a musician or a business person. Now, what should I study in school, music or business? I gave God a choice. What, isn't that the right thing to do? 
to let God at least have an opportunity to say something about what I'm going to do with my life. Some of y'all don't even ask him. So I was a little bit better than you. Some of y'all, Lord, this is what I'm going to do. But I at least asked God, and guess what? I didn't tell him what I was going to do. I said, Lord, you got an option. What do you want me to be, a musician or a business person? Now, that, I'm, don't y'all think I did good? Come on, now, some of y'all, some of y'all, come on, in this room in here, you told him this is what I'm going to do. Bless this. Ain't that what you did? Ain't that what you did? You said, Lord, I'm going to do this. Now, bless it. Lord, I pray a blessing upon my business. Lord, I need you to make this happen for me. I've been to school for this, Lord. Now, bless me. But I gave God a choice. Hallelujah. I did good, didn't I? Don't you think I did good? What y'all say? Thank you, thank you, thank you, man. Somebody let me know I did good. I gave God the option, and you know what he did? The way he is, he say, do whatever you want to do. You'll never be happy till you do what I tell you to do. And I said, that ain't right. Leave me alone. So you know what I did? I fixed him. I majored in business and I minored in music. I got, I got both of them. I got out of school. I started working in business. And then I started doing music at the same time. The musicians know. Y'all know I got music in me. Look like God made a mistake. You know every time the music started moving, can't you see? I'm like, a, like one of them crack addicts. Got to have some crack. I need that music. <laughs> you see me running over here to an instrument, running to the choir. Not sing like that. Oh. I think God sometimes missed it. What y'all say? But we just finished singing a song to say, mold me and make me. See, the thing about it is we don't have the right to tell the maker, the creator, what he created us for. Only he and only the creator has a right to define what he is making. And so here it is. We have to live our life to honor God in the way he says honor him. Not the way we want to honor him, but in the way he says to honor him. And that if we don't honor God in the way that he says, our lives we will find tragically, and I say we will find out tragically, that we will live in a permanent and an unchangeable existence in the next life. In other words, what we do now yes, is going to affect what's going to happen when we cross over. And when we cross over, there are no second chances. Our God is a God of second chances in this world. But when this time is over with, there are no second chances for us. And except a man be born again in this life, there, there will be no eternal life in heaven for him. He can't see it, and I'll show you that in a little bit too. Nor will he enter into that kingdom except he does it God's way. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him one way, one way, not a way, but the way. And it's imperative that everybody gets it, that everybody that makes that choice of the one way is going to experience blessings in the life after this one. Life continues on beyond this existence that we are in. You think that when you die, it's all over? It ain't over. Because God's going to wake us up and let us know life continues on. The status of that life is determined by the type of life we are living here. It's imperative that you get that. That every day that goes by is an opportunity for you to store up for yourself treasures in the world to come. So I read the whole thing again, and I'll do it this way, to cause you to realize that there is life after death. And that failure to honor God, as he says, in this life will tragically result in a permanent and unchangeable existence in the next life he has promised it's going to come. Once you cross over, it's over. 
And what you cross over with is yours. And what you cross over and don't have, you don't have another chance to get it. There are no second chances. Lord, forgive me. I, I, I didn't realize that you were holding me accountable like you were. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. There are no second chances. Do we hear that? And if I got any questions before I go any further, because I'm going to talk to you, because the questions slowed me down. I didn't finish my message, so God got a plan for me to go on. Are y'all clear on what I'm telling you, what my purpose is right now? All right. Now let me go forward. Scripture. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Daniel gets a message, and it says, At that time, say time, time. Michael, the great prince who protects your people, talking about the nation of Israel, are the people of God, which we are now also the people of God. He said, At that time, say time, time. Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time, say time, time. there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, say time, time. your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Now, I highlighted the word time. Now, I'm going to ask you a question that's a test. Let's see if you were keeping up with me, and I just told you and made it very plain. What word did I emphasize? Time. So there's a word that's in there three times. It's in there three times because it's an important time. What is the time? We're going to look at it to see what it is. And that's a good question. What is your tomorrow going to be like? What time is it? Does anybody know what time it is? It is time that we recognize the time that the Lord is talking about, his time. I'm saying it's time. We need to recognize the time that the Lord is saying is his time. We live our lives not recognizing that there's coming a time when God's going to have his time. This is our time. We do what we want to do with our time. We got our choice. But it's going to come a time when we don't have a choice. And that's the time that he says, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress. Now, why will there be a time of distress? Because this is talking about the end times, but the greater time of distress, watch this. He says, it's going to be a time for your people and everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. But let's go to verse 2 and we look at verse 2. Multitudes of people who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life. Others to shame. And notice this word, everlasting contempt. You know why there's going to be a time of such distress? When God raises up people and they realize there ain't no more time. And when people recognize that the life that they live, they're going to have to be held, they're going to be held accountable for it, and they can't change it. That's the worst thing that can ever happen is when you, when you don't have another chance. That's going to be a time of great distress. When you realize you can't correct your mistakes. When you realize, he says here, you will awake to everlasting life. That everlasting life, some are going to have an abundance of life because God will bless them for what they have done in this life. But others will be raised up to shame. And notice, shame, he didn't say shame for a minute. He didn't say shame for our sinners. Like people get sentenced to jail, they go for a certain number of years. But this that God's going to raise us up to or raise people up to, he said it'll be everlasting. Some, to notice the two words that's there, everlasting life, everyone whose name is found written in the book. Others, they're going to get everlasting life, but it'll be everlasting contempt in that life. Are we getting this clear? I need everybody to get it. 
You don't need to worry about what somebody else going to get. You need to be looking out for yourself. You don't need to be worrying about, well, I'm, I'm going to get somebody back. You don't need to get nobody back. You leave the getting back to the Lord. Because he say vengeance is mine. Let God have his way. Folk mess over you, don't you fight them. He say turn the other cheek. And let me tell you something. For everything that you do God's way, God has a reward for it. There's a blessing for it. But when you step outside of God's way, there's a loss of a reward that you could have had if you'd done it God's way. Well, I'm going to make all this stuff plain in just a moment. Let me go on a little bit further. In Revelations 20, verse 12. See, I'm trying to get you to realize there's life after this life. Revelation 20, verse 12 said, And I saw the dead. Now, this is John. Now, I say he saw what? The dead. The dead folk. But they ain't dead when he saw them. Because by the time he saw the dead, all the dead, they should have been rotten corpses. But no, they're not. they dead, but they lied. This is the time of the living dead. He said, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were open. The books were open. Now, see, God got a whole bunch of books of works that folk have done. And he got another book, and that's one of those, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. You see, there's a difference. There's a set of books that's a books of works. And then there's another set, there's another book, not a set. There's volumes of encyclopedia of all the works that every man has done. But then there's another book, and that book has the names of people that have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Life goes on after death. There's going to come a time when we're going to get raised up. John said, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. They all stand before the throne. We're going to stand before the judgment seat. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. God's going to deal with us too as Christians. But then these, he's talking about standing before the throne. The books are open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead are judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. All right, now watch this. Now watch this. Look at verse 15. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, that is, that you accepted Jesus, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, let me get you a little uneven for a moment as we get this together. It's all right. It's all right because I'm here to clarify it. Every one of us is going to stand in judgment. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ if we're Christian. We're going to do that called the Bema seat in, in, in another word for it. And then everybody's going to be judged. The worst going to be judged. But watch this, watch this, watch this. I will take this right side and this left side and show you how it'll be. On this side are people that have accepted Christ. On this side over here are people that have not accepted Christ. They're going to do it by their own works. They're going to do it by another way. They're going to follow what Oprah's got to say. There's another way to make it. All right? I know, don't, this is just a, uh, uh, yeah, an example. Okay, you understand? Do not, don't, don't, get, don't get worried. I'm just using an example. Okay. Now watch what happens. These people have accepted Christ. These have not. Everybody's going to be judged according to the works that they've done. Now, God, who is a holy God, is going to have, let's just see, we'll start. No, we'll start over here. <laughs> He's going to look at us, those at us. Now, oh, I said us. <laughs> I might be slipping. Okay, but what? He's going to look at this group, and he's going to look at their works, and he's going to see, first of all, Jesus. And he's going to say, now, I noticed some of their works. I see Jesus, so I'm going to start at Jesus, and I'm going to look at the works that they have done that are good. 
and I'm going to reward them for all of their good works. They will receive a reward. Even if it was just giving a cup of water to somebody, when they showed love to somebody, I'm going to reward them eternally for all they've done. When they turn the other cheek, when they smile to somebody, when they encourage somebody, when they, when they brought their tithe in, I'm going to reward them for it. When, 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 when they were paying attention to the word of God and not texting, I'm going to award them for them. I'm going to bless them for loving. I'm going to bless them for forgiving the molesters in their life. I'm going to bless them when they forgive those who roll their eyes at them. I'm going to bless them for every good thing that they have done. I'm going to look at their works, all of their good works, and I'm going to bless them according to the works that they have done. And each one will be given his place. Each one will receive. And then he will look at those that are on his left on the other side. And when he looks at their works, the first thing he's going to see or the negative things they've done. If I were in this case, I will tell you all the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth that when I was younger, my mom remembers, I was in grade school and my cousin came from St. Louis. And we went around to the grocery store, the neighborhood store, and I stole an apple. <laughs> you remember that, Mom? And y'all made me go around there and apologize. I didn't steal but one apple. But that was sin. That's right. Now, my cousin, he stole some candy bars and a few other things. And when he got away with it, I felt bad about the apple. He said, let's go back. We can get you some candy, too. And I said, his name was Junior. I said, Junior, I, I can't do that. You can go and bring me something back. <laughs> and he went back. And he came back. And I had me some candy too. <laughs> but Mr. Collada, the, the, the store owner, had seen me and had seen my cousin. And he called my aunt. And I was caught. So on the day of judgment, when God will raise me up, if I have not accepted Christ, he's going to look at my record. He's going to say, Jim, you stole an apple. And I'm going to say, yes, that's sin. But God, that was just an apple. But sin cannot be in my presence. But Lord, what about them other folk? Well, you didn't bring nothing about they did. They did stuff, but guess what? Theirs was paid for. Yours isn't paid for. But Lord, it was an apple. You got to pay for that apple, Jim. See, for them, when God looked at their life, he sees that a price, the price for sin was paid on the cross of Calvary through the one way, the only way, the blood of the Lamb of God. For there is no other way. Thank you, Lord. And when it comes down to me, I got to account for the apple and cause it's sin. I got to pay the price of sin in my life. But Lord, what about all the good things I've done? I can't see the good things because your sin looms so big before me. But Lord, it was just an apple. But do you not understand, Jim? I am a holy, holy, holy God. And a holy God cannot tolerate even a speck of sin. And the Lord will look at me and all of those who have not accepted Christ. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Nobody paid the price of your sin. But what about all the good I did? None is righteous. All of your righteousness was as filthy rags to me. I gave you an opportunity to take your scarlet and to make it white as snow. I gave you an opportunity. Time and time again, I sent somebody for you to turn 
from your wicked ways. And time and time again, you kept doing it your own way and not my way. You didn't let me have my way. You didn't let me mold you and make you. You choose to go on your own, now you're free to go. That's where it shall be at the judgment. Some will be raised to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt. If anyone's name was not found written in the book, that is the book. Jesus said to his apostles one time, he said to them, don't rejoice at the fact that demons respond to you. Rejoice at the fact that your name has been written in the book. You see, the most important thing in life is to recognize is that there is another life. There are many that are last now that will be first in the kingdom of God. There are many that think they are high and mighty in this world. Don't run after things of this world because you are not of this world. You're just passing through this world. You're just here for a moment. Your life is more than what you see with your eyes right now. We should be focused on the world that is to come. The eternal world that is to come. The permanent world that is to come. This one shall pass away. Anyone's name who was not found written in the book, notice what he says. He was thrown into the lake of fire. He is not taken to the lake of fire. He has no choice. He's picked up kicking and screaming, and nobody can save him, and he's cast off into the lake of fire, which was a place that was prepared for the devil and his demons, never for human beings. Can you imagine the torment that will be experienced? Now, let me just, I'm just giving you, I'm telling you all the stuff up front. I'm fixing to back it all up. So let's just look at the key points I'm going to make as we go through this message. Your life is more than what you're able to see now. That's the most important point you need to get. You need to get that. Your life is more than what you can see now. I told you that last week. You got it. Take a picture of it. You don't have to write it down. Just move on. You got a cell phone. Two, there are rewards and blessings available for your life after this life. There are rewards and blessings for your life after this one. This life ain't all it's cracked up to be. Don't get caught up on stuff in this one. Don't chase after stuff in this life. You got more coming for you. Rewards and blessings available after this life. Keep that in mind. Three, there are also the possibility of tragic consequences after this life. There are blessings available, but there's a possibility of tragic consequences. I need you to understand this, that there are many that are among us who think that they have Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they only have him as their Savior because if he is Lord, you must do as I say do. The Bible tells us that God says that there will be wheat and there will be tares among the wheat. That means in churches, people, and don't get it wrong, there are people in churches that are just weeds. They're not the wheat of God, but they are weeds. And they will challenge you and your ability to grow. But it's not for you to go around and judge who they are because the word of God said we can't tell the difference between them. So I can sit up and look in here. Some of these folk in this room may not make it into the kingdom. I can't tell it. The Bible says that you can look and you can see the fruit. But sometimes we can even mistake that. So we need to be careful how we get judgmental towards one another. We need to treat everybody with love and treat everybody with respect because we never know. Even the ones that we're liking may be just a weed in the church and a weed to be able to deceive us and cause us to go the wrong way. Fourth point. I want you to look at each man determines for himself the quality and the place of his eternity. Every one of us has a choice. Every one of us has a choice for the place and the quality of our eternity. You're making that decision today. Get me, get me, get me. Today you're making that decision. Now, let's go to another scripture here, and I want to talk about this. Your life is more than what you're able to see now, and we're going to look at John 14, verse 1. And I'm going to build off of this as we go over the next few scriptures here so that you can begin to see. Jesus says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. 
This is a funeral sermon message. And I'll explain it to you in a moment. You'll be able to see it. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You know it from the King James, you believe in God, believe also in me. And now the NIV says, trust in God, trust also in me. In other words, Jesus is saying he's putting himself on the same level of God. He is saying that later on you find out that he and God are one and the same. He is not a God. He is the God. He is God in the flesh. You believe in God, believe also in me. Then he goes on and makes this, this marvelous recognition here. In my father's house are many rooms. In my father's house are many what? King James. Mansions. And he say, if it were not so, I would have told you. But notice this. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Now stop for a moment. He's going where? But where is he going? His father's house. But I want it to be more explicit than that. He's about to die. Where is he going? Where is he going in the next few hours? He is about to go to the cross where he is about to die on that cross. The cross will become the bus that's going to take him to heaven. Death becomes the plane, the train that ushers us to a new environment. Now, I ain't talking about folk not saved now. You need to understand this. You're going to the wrong place. You know? Don't get on that train and you're not saved. But death for Jesus was the vehicle that was going to be the salvation of all mankind. Because of sin, death had to be. Somebody had to die. God sent his son to die. So that we would not have to. We would not have to experience eternal death and separation from God. God sent his son and his son experienced death and paid the price of sin. It went all the way back from Adam and Eve all the way to the end of time. The price was paid through the blood and the death of Christ. And when the price was paid then you could no longer hold Christ after the price is paid. And if the price is paid, none of us who have accepted Jesus have to pay the price. It's like when we go to the McDonald's, the person in front of us paid for the Happy Meal. We don't have to pay anymore. It's been paid for. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, so he's talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about preparing a place for you. It's important that we understand that he is going by death to do that, to prepare a place, to prepare a place. Where is he now? He's not dead. Jesus is not dead. He is with the Father. All of this indicates that there is a place after death where we all will go. There is a place after death, if we're with Christ, that has been what? Prepared for us. Prepared not for us as a body, but prepared for each and every one of us. God is so awesome that he, he has prepared a place for you, for you, for you, for you, for you, for every one of us. Every one of us has a place that's prepared for us. What will our tomorrow be like? What kind of place will we have? It's determined by how we act today. I go to prepare a place, he's saying this, for you, for every one of us. And if every man's going to be judged according to his own work, that means the place is going to be different for each individual person. We're going to have different places. Just like the stars have different magnitudes. Look at all those stars. They all are not the same brightness. So in the kingdom to come, every one of us will shine at a different level of magnitude, having differences according to the way we have lived this life. Y'all hear me? 
You want to talk to me? But I thought as long as I accept Jesus, everything all right. No, it's a quality of life you need to experience with Jesus. To accept Jesus is not the end of it. If you've accepted Jesus, then you need to live your life like you've accepted Jesus. Let me show you something now. Let me tell you what happens and what, what went on here. Proof that life goes on after death. I'm going to take a death of somebody and show you they kept on living. In Luke 23, 42, when Jesus talks to the thief on the cross, remember he was crucified among two thieves? One of them said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him. Now, what's going to happen to this guy? He's about to die, right? And what does Jesus say to him on that day he's about to die? I tell you the truth, today you will be with me where? In paradise. In other words, you won't be dead after the day. You'll still be living and you'll be with me in paradise. Death is not the end of it, y'all. If you think it's all over when it's over, it ain't over. Till God says it's over. Death is not the end of your life. Your life goes on. And here it is. This is the thing that the thief is realizing. He says, remember me. And Jesus say, today. Well, today in the natural environment, today that thief was about to die. But that thief was not going to die. That thief was going to get on the bus. And he was going to cross over. He was going to be with Jesus. You will be with me. So in other words, what other people thought of death, that he was going to die, Jesus was going to die, was merely the appearance of death. See, there are things that look a certain way to us, but it ain't the way that it really is. When somebody dies, we put them in a casket right here. We think that's the end of it. We get miserable. Oh, they're dead. Oh, they're dead. They ain't dead. That's just their body that's up here. They're still alive. The body that we have is just like this coat I have on. If I were to wear a certain garment all the time, you'd see that garment. you say, that reminds me of Bishop. Yeah. You recognize the distinctive difference between my garments and who I am. This body is not our eternal body. We live in this thing. This is a, a space suit, an earth suit that we have to live in here. There's going to come a time when we're going to be free. We take off this space suit. We take off this earth suit and we go back and we are like God if we have accepted the ways of God. That's our eternal life. This body is worth nothing. How much does it cost? Somebody knows how much this body is worth. What is it? It's just a few cents, isn't it? Inflation is added, so maybe it's a dollar or two more. Does anybody remember how they calculate how many chemicals are in this body and everything? It's the life that matters. So don't worry about the one that can take your physical body. Worry about the one that has control over your life. So death is not the end of our lives. And let me show you further. Dead folk can hear. Dead folk ain't dead. They got ears and they can hear. So you need to be careful how you speak of the dead. They listening. You remember Lazarus? Did Jesus touch him? Jesus called him. If Jesus called him, how did Lazarus know to get up? Unless he heard him. But Lazarus was dead four days. He would, what, come, come on, help me now. I think the Bible said he was what? Where was he? How, where was he? Was he dead, y'all? Martha told us, four days, stinking dead. You can't be no deader than stinking dead. I mean, I know people at the hospital, they die for a minute or two, but four days, and Martha said, He's thinking dead, God. That's real dead. And Jesus said, roll away the stone. And they rolled away the stone. And there was a participant. And you got to understand, you got to be participating in your miracle, too. Uh, that's another statement. We'll deal with that later on. If you don't believe in God to believe to, to participate to remove the stone, you won't see the miracle. But anyway, that's just another point. We'll add that later on. For those who have ears to hear, 
sometimes you don't get a blessing until you remove the stone that's blocking your blessing. Sometimes you got to remove that stone so God can bless you. God been trying to bless you, and you got a stone in the way. Well, I can't move it because of this. I can't trust God. I can't tie. God not going to bless me. I, I, I can't. You better remove that stone. But let me go on because my time's going short. Okay. So when he said, Lazarus, come forth, he didn't go over there and shake him. He didn't go... In the name of my name, get up, touch him. He didn't put no water on him. He just called him. So the stinking dead can hear. You already know that. On the walking dead, if you drop something, they coming at you. <laughs> so the dead can hear. You ever know that? You don't make no noise when the dead be around you. You make noise, they go, So lock in, dead people can hear, and they'll hear. The, but let me get the word of God to show you that. Come on now. John 5.24, I'm going to hurry up because I'm watching my, ooh, time going short. 5.24, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth. Second time he says it. A time is coming and now has come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Dead folk will hear. Death is not the end of life. Life goes on after death. Dead folk hear. Verse 26, for the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Now, verse 28, don't be amazed that I'm telling you dead folk here, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice. So don't be amazed when I told you some will, but I'm telling you all are going to hear, and they will come out, and those who have done good will rise to live. Those who have done good, good, good will rise to live. And what is the good? What good thing must I do? What it is to accept him who has been sent. And those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. So there is going to be a judgment for all of us. And when the living dead, I'm going to show you the day of the living dead. In Matthew 27, 50. Now Jesus is on the cross. He's getting ready to die. Now get ready, I'm going to show you this. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. He let go. He gave up his spirit. His spirit that was in his body, he let it go. And the Bible very clearly says he bowed his head and died. He didn't drop his head. You know, when people die, they're like, like that. But Jesus, they said, bowed his head and died. It's like Jesus just said, okay, y'all, I'm fixing to go. See y'all later. Went to sleep. He was in full control. No man taketh my life, but I give it up. And it said when he did that, verse 51, at that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. There was an earthquake. And that thing of the curtain being torn in the temple was that God, man's way to God was completely opened by God. But verse 52 tells us this. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. When Jesus died, the dead folk, holy dead folk, came to life. What are they coming to life? They weren't dead. They came to life. See, there was a time when there was a walking dead. The living dead walked the earth when Jesus died. Verse 53, they came out of their tombs. Get this. Can you imagine what that looked like? And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. They came out of their tombs. And he, I don't know what they did for those three days. Can you imagine in the middle of the night, Uncle Joe <laughs> knocking at your door? Get the first word, you're going to say, Jesus. <laughs> and notice 54, when the centurion saw 
and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, even those graves and stuff, they were terrified. Wouldn't you be terrified? And they gave us a recognition. Surely he was the son of God. To understand, people, that there, is going to, that there is life after death. Our life is more than what we see. Death is not the end of our lives. And this is just simply, I'll tell you, this, this is not the end of this message. But I've got to end it right here. Yeah. I know some of y'all say, that, I don't believe it, but I'm ending it right here. <laughs> You're going to have to come back next week for the rest of the story. <laughs> but I'm going to take a moment from you for you to clearly understand what I've said. You have an opportunity this day to decide whether you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior or, or not. You have this day to recognize you can do it your way or you can do it God's way. You can live the rest of your life the way you want to live it, or you can live it God's way. Give me my purpose again so that we can see that one more time. One more time, please. To cause you to realize that there is life after death. Does everybody get that point? My first point. Anybody challenged with that? Because in the first service, the guy said, well, I thought when you die, you're just dead. What's the scripture say? What did we read in Daniel chapter 12? What did we read in Revelations? What did Jesus say? Life goes on after death to encourage people that have death in their families to recognize life goes on. Don't get narrow-minded to see things the way you want to see it. Have thine own way, Lord. Mold me and make me in your way, okay? Now, there's life after death. And a failure to honor God as he says, not the way you want to honor God, but as he says to honor him. It's imperative you get this, people. I don't have a lot of time to press this upon you, but it's important that you understand you must honor God the way he says honor him, not the way you want to honor him. You've got to follow God's way. There is but one way, and that's God's way, to honor him as he says if you don't. Tragically, you're going to find out it is going to result in a permanent, I can't change it. Once you're dead, it's over. You know what's over? Your opportunity to get greater rewards. Every day you live, you have an opportunity to honor God so that God said, even who gives a cup of water to a prophet, he'll get a prophet's reward. Everything you do, every little thing you do, God's going to bless you for it. If it's for the glory of God's kingdom, if it doesn't go for the glory of God, why should you even do it? Look, that one statement I got in there, Charles, at the bottom down there, if it does not, the part down there, let me just go to that because I got a lot of scripts I got to do. If an action does not produce positive eternal consequences, why do it? I'm asking you something now. If it doesn't produce something positive for eternity, why are you doing it? Because notice this, and I finish this real quick. If I am not doing the work of God, I'm doing the work of Satan. And when I don't do the work of God, I lose the reward I could have gotten for doing the work of God. As a Christian, my eternity is not at stake. My, my, my separation from God is not. God will raise me up and say, Jim, let's see the goods that you've done. I'm going to reward you for it. My sins have been paid for. I'll be measured out according to what I've done. And there will be distinctive differences between each and every one of us because each and every one of us will serve God in different ways. And if it doesn't make a positive result for you, why do it? 